I remember when I went to school at Kutztown in the 1960s. Things were a lot different. I think her name was Rickenbach. She had some crazy ideas about the men and the women and how they should socialize. It seemed fine then, but today when we look back on it, it's really strange. <laughs> Mary Edna Rickenbach was the Dean of Women. There was a Dean of Women and a Dean of Men. John White was the Dean of Men, and Mary Edna Rickenbach was the Dean of Women. And we used to have women's assemblies. And I don't remember what they were about anymore, but the jokes were, if you're going to sit on a man's lap, you should at least put a phone book down so that you know nothing untoward would happen. You were not to wear patent leather shoes because you were wearing a skirt and the patent leather would reflect and young men could see up your skirt, which of course is not true. You should not wear red because it excited men. The general rule was that if you were going to sit on the sofa with a person of the opposite sex, you had to have a phone book between you and that other person. I mean, this was, you know, it, it was very strange. Uh, looking back, it, and if you tell kids now this stuff, when people hear this, they'll think you're nuts. But that's the way it was, and nobody rebelled against it because that's just the way it was. <laughs> My friends and I, we all laughed. We thought it was foolish. We always wondered how they were going to patrol <laughs> and what would happen if you were caught and you didn't have a phone book between you and the other person. She was an old maid, so she wasn't into relationships with men. <laughs> oh dear. Um, society would react to this today and say that it's foolishness. I'm sure that with all the things that are going on in society today, especially this idea of transgender, that it would be looked at as sort of archaic. That's my father's generation or even further back. <laughs> I don't know. There, I never met her. And by the 70s, when I went there, it was pretty much those things were done, you know, and go on. Mrs. Ziegenfuss really jogged my memory about some of the strange things that went on here at Kutztown during this time. I think they were called customs. And one of the strangest customs was this thing that we called a dink. And all the freshmen had to wear them. There was a thing called customs. As a freshman, you were required to wear a dink which is a hard little beanie with a very small visor and had your year of graduate your yeah your year of graduation on which indicated to the upperclassmen that we were tiny itty bitty small people on a large college campus and after dinner the customs officials which were upperclassmen usually about juniors would herd you outside and walk you around campus. You were required to learn both verses of the alma mater. If a customs official came up to you during the day and asked you to do something, you had to stop what you were doing and, and do it. And of course you were identified because you were wearing this stupid hat, your dink. I don't think anybody felt, I'm sure there were some people. I figured, you know, if I did this and then they would go away and leave me alone. So it wasn't, it wasn't that obtrusive, intrusive, I guess. It wasn't that intrusive, um, but you just sort of did it because you were a freshman. Every other freshman had to do this, so it's your turn to do this, you did it. At least that was my, uh, you know, my opinion. When we had the frosh pin issued to us, my friends and I, we said, the hell with this pin, the hell with this beanie, we aren't going to wear this because we are older than that, and therefore we did not want to be identified as a frosh. So we took the pins off 
and also the beanies off and put them away. At one point in time, we kind of went and made a circle around the customs officials and, and kind of, I guess, maybe not terrorized them, but uh, we, did, we rebelled. We didn't like to do this, this, this walking around campus. But for a, I don't remember how long customs last, a couple, a week, maybe two, not very long. But there were customs. Wearing a dink was really strange. It identified us freshmen as all together. I am really glad I don't have to wear that dink any longer. And I am so glad that I lost it. I think I might have even burned it. Another strange thing about Kutztown was the awful food. It was just terrible. Before you went into the dining room for lunch or for dinner, you had to wait in the blue room, which is that bridge across from Old Main to the Georgian dining room. And you stood there in this herd, then they opened the doors and you all rushed into the dining room. We had three meals per day. We had breakfast, which you had to get up very early if you wanted to get, you wanted to get breakfast. And they only served it until eight o'clock. Then there were two lunch periods. And at lunch, all the men had to wear a coat. You had to wear a suit coat to go to lunch. And for dinner, the men had to wear a coat and tie. So all of us guys, we all had a standard coat and a standard tie. It was the same one every day. Young ladies could wear knee socks. No, there was no pants. You, there were no pantsuits. You wore skirts and knee socks. And that was okay at lunch. At dinner, uh, and especially on Sunday, Sunday dinner at noontime, ladies were supposed to dress as if gone to church. No knee socks, only silk stockings. It was a very, very good experience for most of us who had never come from a home that in which formal dinners were held like that. But we had dinner here every night. Your requirement was, of course, that you needed to dress for dinner. Now, the way that they served the food was also something that was unique. The service was in the Georgian dining room. They served it at round tables. There were approximately 10 people <laughs> at each table. So all the guys would sit together, all the girls would sit together, and then they would serve it country style. In other words, they would start in one, with one person, and that person would then pass the food to his left or right, and by the time it got around to the 10th person, there'd be hardly any food left. You had bread, uh, water, and usually apple butter at the table so that if things were really terrible as far as, you never knew what you were getting for lunch until you got there. Uh, if it was really awful, then you had at least bread and butter and apple butter to eat. One day, my buddies and I decided that we thought that the girls would eat less food than we would eat. <laughs> So we decided to sit with the girls. Two or three of us picked out a table and sat with the girls. And they started the food <laughs> with the girls. We thought, oh, by the time it gets to us, there'll be plenty left for us to eat. By the time it got to us, there was less food left for us than there would have been if we sat with all males. So that ended our experiment sitting with the women. We decided we would now no longer sit with the women. Only the men <laughs> would get more food. <laughs> not, only, not only was the food bad, but the dress attire was very inconvenient. We had to wear coat and tie. But this is nothing compared to the cost of college today. That's, that's a wild comparison because as I recall, my father felt that it cost him $1,000 a year to send me here. 
that was it, a thousand bucks. I don't remember at this point whether that included books. Books have become extremely and exorbitantly expensive. It is literally true that in my years, if you had a good summer job, you could pay for that year's education. Almost nobody carried any school debt. The biggest change, I would guess, and the reason I believe that tuition is so high, again, goes back to the state. The state used to contribute, don't hold me to these figures, but the state used to contribute, I think, up to maybe 60 or 70 percent of the cost of running an institution. I mean, I feel bad for kids that virtually get out of college with a mortgage and no house, you know, <laughs> yeah, and possibly no job. So it's, it's, it's a real crisis in higher education, I think. Um, I once told the president of East Stroudsburg that the only person who could feed thousands with two loaves and two fishes was long dead and that you needed more than that to run an institution. I mean, this is still a, a very reasonable and cheaper than other alternatives kind of thing, uh, so I'm not criticizing where we're at. I don't think it's a person's birthright either to go to college, but it's really getting to the point where many people cannot afford it at all. Was Kutztown the best time of my life? I don't know. Was it the best of times? Was it the worst of times? It was fun. And what it did do was provide me with a rock solid education, which provided for me and my family. So when I go back to Kutztown, I have fond memories.